Um, so what I will do is um, first get the panelists to uh, introduce themselves and mainly the point of this introduction hopefully will give us a bit of background about who they are, what their position is, but also a chance for them to acknowledge you know, any biases, you know, um, anything they want to disclose, just for you guys as well. So um, Ruth, would you like to start off? Sure. It's just so you know, oh, yeah, speaking. Hi everyone, my name's Ruth Tyson, and for another 45 days I'm a member of Parliament. I'm finishing that job at 7 pm, September 19. <laughs> um, I've been in Parliament for nearly 27 years, and um, I love the job. I represent um, the best of in the country, called Hills in Christchurch, where we have flats and fires and clubs and stuff. It's been a long few years, and this. Um, Topic is one that's a personal passion of mine. I've been very active in the end of life choice space for a long time. One of the rare times that I get to work with members of the parliament um, with, with whom I have nothing else in common. <laughs> it's a polite way to describe it. It's absolutely good to see so much interest in this, and I'm looking forward to the evening and to hear all the views of the other two panels.
to acknowledge that there are a wide range of views on this topic and I want to acknowledge uh, respect for everyone's uh, views on this important piece of legislation. Thank you for being here tonight and I really encourage you being students and being students of the law to really come to grips with this particular piece of legislation. Um, Parliament has made a decision, I respect they have made a call to put this out to New Zealanders to vote uh, a yes or no. And so it's incumbent on all of us to really understand this legislation. So uh, no matter really thank you for being here tonight and I look forward to our discussion. I'll jump on the back of what Paul was saying to say that um, it is really great to see so many of you guys here and there is an opportunity for you to ask questions. So when these three panels are talking and if you think um, that there is something you want more answers on or, or, or clarify, um, please do um, write those questions down and, and, and we will um, do our best to ask them. Um, if we start off though, I guess, um, figuring out from the three of you, um, what your involvement has been through the end of life choice act process, because I think it's not very obvious sometimes how uh, we get to where we are, which is deciding and being part of a referendum, which I think Ruth is actually probably best to start with you in many ways, and what has your involvement um, been with this act? Okay, um, so just go back a step. Um, this is the third time in my time in Parliament, actually I think the third time ever, that we have had this type of legislation before Parliament. The first time, um, then National MP Michael Moores uh, introduced it, and it failed at the, I can't remember the same, probably failed at first reading, I think. Um, then the New Zealand First Member of Parliament, Peter Brown, introduced a similar piece of legislation that was defeated as well. And then this third time, Brad Seymour from ACT introduced the bill that's been through all the processes um, and then passed on, the, passed on the third reading, but its implementation is dependent on the referendum being passed. Um, my involvement has been right from the Michael Moore's time um, to be part of a cross party group which listened to members of all parties, not just our own party, but sort of representing our own party, and relaying specific concerns about the bill that we had heard, um, debating in that cross-party group changes that might be made, and then deciding, uh, you know, it was basically how do we get this across the line in a form that we're satisfied with, but also that meets the concerns of parties. So that, that was my role again in um, the status legislation, so there were, you know, half a dozen of us. Um, some people were on the part of the community to be replaced because they got too busy with other things. So we had all parties represented, um, open discussion that was like confidential because we shared a lot of information with each other and we then debated amongst ourselves whether we put up amendments and whether we support it and how we get um, where, what we achieved in the final third reading, which was in June of June. So, um, highly a lot of active involvement in this, and plus I sat on the seat for me for many days and listened to submissions. Hi, what's what your involvement <coughs> and trust in this act? Uh, so thank you to the organisers for inviting me because in the process of accepting the invitation and doing background research, I've learned a lot. And I have to admit that I really didn't know very much other than the fact that as I get older, I would like to be able to have the freedom to choose if I ever become really incapacitated. And I find it interesting that I was actually invited to the euthanasia panel. So when I did some background research and looked up what the act involved, there was no mention of euthanasia. So there's been a change of terminology uh, which I think needs a bit of clarification. So it turns my interest. Uh, I was also asked to bring in an indigenous perspective to the discussion. And I found I had a little bit disconcerting because I can give one perspective as a, someone who grew up knowing that he's Māori and who identifies as Māori and who has lots of indigenous 
change not not the world. But that's just one perspective. And in the in, in, uh, process of researching the topic, it's quite clear that there are many perspectives. There are many indigenous perspectives, there are many Maori perspectives, and there are many people who are in favor, and there are many people who are not in favor of the legislation. So that's really important to know, to, to identify as a standing point. So what do I bring to this panel? Well, I bring a lot of personal experience. Uh, I refer to the fact I grew up on dairy farm, where the notion of putting down an animal was something with which I grew up. And I have very vivid memories of the deaths of animals. And I could take you to the place where a cow was euthanized or put down. And I can still remember the circumstances in which they happened. I have also experienced the, the deaths of close friends, and I've experienced the death of my mother at very close quarters. And I'm just going to read you. Uh, so I'm going to read you something that um, appears in the Australian Dictionary of Biography. And we have our own version here, the New Zealand Dictionary of Biography, which talks about the lives of important people. And I dare say that in the future, sometimes there'll be an interest. It's awesome because of your contribution to our society. So in 1987, Brian McGann was diagnosed positive for the human immunodeficiency virus, actually. He decided to show that his carefully considered choice of voluntary euthanasia could be achieved in a dignified manner. Never married, he died on the 3rd of April 1990 at his Elizabeth Day home, accompanied by five close friends, and was cremated. He had fought with determination and enthusiasm for what he believed in, often against great opposition. Now, the cause of death was known as HIV AIDS, but the cause of death was actually that he chose to end his life. When I met Brian, he was a friend, he pointed out that he had left he had kept a bottle of Nembutal that had been prescribed to him by his doctor in the event that he became so unwell that he wanted to end his life. And he did become unwell, and he decided that he would consume the bottle of Nembutal that his doctor had left given him. He was also surrounded by five friends, and presumably that was against the law. This is somebody to take their own lives. This was back in 1987. But what's not in this account is that he was visited by a prominent politician who knew that something was up and she turned up at his apartment for a bottle of wine. Now she knew that he was in the process of ending his life, surrounded by friends. She's now a prominent mayor of a major city in Australia. And presumably she also was complicit in breaking the law. So those are some of the circumstances that I'm familiar with. Um, I'll tell you a bit about the other experiences I've had in my life. In order to disclose what I saw on this issue, uh, I would like to be able to choose between my life if I ever had the need to do so. All right. Um, <laughs> I'll just put it up in the officer's involvement in the accident. Sure. So I've been in this role for three years. And when I came into the role, I have to say this was not a topic or an area that I thought I would get involved in. I came into this role with a very clear sense of what I wanted to help achieve for disabled people and improve outcomes for our lives in New Zealand. But it became apparent to me very quickly from the sheer number of disabled people that contacted me, that talked to me, about this issue. And so I started to look into it. I made a submission off the back of the Commission's earlier submission. And the earlier submission was very simple. It said, from a human rights perspective, there's nothing inherently wrong with having an end of life regime. But it must meet certain criteria. And one of those areas of criteria is it must have adequate safeguards. And that is what I have mostly focused on, is 
the adequacy or in my view inadequacy of the safeguards. In order to understand the issue much more, I engaged our legal team. I met with the lawyers who drafted the initial bill. I read the submissions in the court cases around the Lucretia Seals High Court case. I read overseas submissions. I met with some international experts, including at the UN. I met with a wide range of disability audiences up and down the country. I wrote to political parties asking to engage with their caucuses to understand perspectives in order to try and make this piece of legislation safer. And I studied overseas regimes, the ones that are most similar to our context here in New Zealand. Uh, so that was Victoria, Oregon, and Canada. And what I was struck by is actually, in my view, which I know we'll talk about tonight, about the inadequacy of the safe powers, and I've talked in many public forums about those, and I'm really tonight you know, reiterating those. I also talked with many disabled people and their families about the context in which disabled people live in New Zealand. And again, we'll talk about that later, but suffice to say for now, and one of the things I'm often talk about is I don't see this as being really a debate about the choice issue. The two reasons. One, what Parliament is asking us to do is not to say yes or no to who we want in assisted dying or euthanasia regime. That's not what we're being asked. What we are being asked to vote on is a specific piece of legislation. And so it's that specific piece of legislation that we all now have a responsibility to really understand. And that's a tough call in the sense that um, it means we'll have to read it. We'll have to think about how it relates to the context in which this law will sit. The second reason uh, around choice is we don't exercise choice from a legal playing field. We exercise it from quite a different level playing field. And I can say from my work in this country for the last three years, and I've been privileged to serve this role for these five, and many disabled New Zealanders are simply not able to exercise choice and are not supported to exercise choice. Now that in of itself is not a particular reason why I have argued the human rights arguments I've argued, but it's the absence of safeguards that make the choice uh, <coughs> questionable and difficult. That's me for now. Thank you. Thanks, Paula. I just want to remind people of how to actually ask questions. So if you go on to the um, event Facebook page, there is a Google forum, and that way you can um, ask questions anonymously as well, because I know that is, that is a tough topic. So if you go there and you submit, submit some questions, we'll go and get them towards the end. Um, well, I'm actually going to stick with you, if that's okay, because I think you mentioned a couple of things that I thought was, were quite interesting, and, and I think um, we think about the fact that there are almost two elements at times, one, whether you agree or disagree with the inherent concept of euthanasia, but like you say, some people might be really for that concept, but are looking for safeguards. And if we talk about the implications of passing this act, what are some of the things, I want to use the word grapple, what are some of the things that you grapple with when you think about the implications of this act being passed? Just you think that this is all? So, I know we have a very specific question about safeguards um, later on, but what I want to say in response to that question uh, for now is my concern is really for the voices of the most mar some of the most marginalised people in our country. And you know, I recall when I made my submission to select committee, and a lady came up afterwards to me and she said that she was a nurse. And I met her before. And she said, oh, I'm really grateful for what you're saying because actually I've been a nurse for some time and I often have young women 
with learning disabilities who don't know what they are here for at the clinic that they come to. And for me, that was quite powerful early on, not to suggest for one minute that um, all people would be in that position, but it really made me focus on the safeguards or the lack of adequate safeguards. So the lack of training for health professionals, the real difficult uh, tasks that the medical profession have in detecting coercion. There is no bright line test between disability and terminal illness. There really is just no bright line test. And what I'm really concerned about is a lack of oversight in this legislation. So there are uh, parts of this legislation which actually prevent the publication of quite critical information to enable us as New Zealanders in a role like mine to really inquire into how this act is operating, where such deaths might occur, by whom. Those are things that, as a transparent country, I think is critical and is absent from the legislation. So I think the implications could be that in passing a piece of legislation, as I've said many times before, if we pass a piece of legislation where those safeguards are not sufficient to protect wrongful deaths, then there may be wrongful deaths. And I don't want to overstate or, or over-dramatise that. It's just as it could be if the safeguards are not adequate. And I think in this particular piece of legislation, the safeguards uh, are not adequate in my view. I wonder if I can just ask more questions. What she just said, they have no sense to me at all. Um, and that was the point about there's no bright line test between disability and terminal illness. And I really want to push back on that. If I thought that a person with a learning disability who wasn't mentally competent to understand the implications of a request for end of life choice medication, if I thought that that was allowable under the law, then I'd be concerned. It is not. One of the primary features of the request has to be your mental competence. And if people are at a clinic not knowing why they're there, then they would not meet the threshold for mental competence, but nor do they have a terminal illness. Not as a result of the learning disability, so, so they don't meet the criteria. They have to be terminally ill with a condition that physicians expect you to die within six months, and you know, hopefully they'll live longer. There's no, there's no, you know, 180 days to go. There's no, no such ability in medicine, but that's what the physicians would expect your life expectancy. But they have to be competent to make the request. So, I totally disagree. There's an absolutely fundamental difference between a disabled person who may not want to live, that's, that's something that we have an entirely different responsibility to do something about. We need to support that person to remove whatever barriers are between them and a good life as much as we can and get them into a space where they not only want to live but they're really having a good time. That's our responsibility. But they would not be eligible to request end of life choice medication. It doesn't matter how much they wanted to get their life, they would not be eligible under the legislation. But if, but if that's the case, I don't think we should just say, well, they don't qualify. We should say, what's well, our responsibility as New Zealand citizens to say what's happening in this person's life and where can we step in and help? That's outside the legislation, but it's a bit of a moral compass that I think we all might share. What I, what I agree with, with Dr. Phillips, the question of the question, I'll respond back. What I agree with her, Don, is I think the intention of the legislation is such that a very certain group of people fit within the eligibility criteria. However, what I disagree with is that this legislation makes it very clear. So I'll, I'll say again, from my perspective, there is no bright line to this between disability and terminal illness. Which means that people or, or, or views that the Act prevents people from accessing the regime because they are disabled 
is not correct. And it's not just my view, right? There's, there's been a few studies that have talked about this. There have been others. There are many types of impairments that by their nature are terminal. And the point at which someone becomes surgeon if they are in a six-month prognosis is not clear. Now, I'm no medical expert, but certainly what the medical profession have been saying in these submissions is that it's very difficult to make that six-month prognosis. They refer to it as being much more of an art than a science. A number of disabled people are therefore actually under the way in which the Act is constructed, are likely to be eligible or become eligible very easily because of the absence of that bright line test. What Parliament tried to do in amending the legislation, because you may recall the very original bill had a much wider scope, and Parliament tried to tighten that scope, in fact, to make it much clearer. Um, who this was intended for. But actually what we now have is a piece of legislation which says, by definition, you have to have a terminal illness and an irreversible state of decline in physical capability. It is entirely possible that by virtue of being disabled and not having something like cancer, which is what people generally think of, you can have some neuromuscular conditions absolutely meet that definition. So the next clause in the bill that says by reason of disability alone doesn't get you in, is going to create quite a bit of confusion. Are you in or are you out? But I think one of the things that, and again we'll all come back to this later when we talk about safeguards, is if safeguards around, I really do want to talk really about coercion and competence and uh, who can request this because Coercion and confidence and how you test for those is actually incredibly complex and something which the disability community wrestle with a lot. And that makes it. No, that's Yeah, hi. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I think we need, to, we need to acknowledge that we are dealing with a health system that is based on significant disparity. And for Māori in particular, those disparities are extremely significant. And from before birth, right through to death, Māori suffer significantly worse health outcomes than everybody else. So I'd like to be given the confidence that I, as a Māori, and anyone else in this country, would have the same access as everybody else. And I'm not confident that would be available. I have read submissions from the Medical Association saying that everybody should have equal access to palliative care as an alternative to end of life choice. But we know that levels of access for Māori are far, far lower than they are for the rest of the country. So we have to confront the fact that there are significant disparities. And until such time as those disparities have been eradicated, and I'm not confident it's going to happen in my lifetime, unfortunately, and it's also shown as those disparities have been eradicated. I don't think it's fair to say or fair to deny end of life choice uh, to the population. And, and I just want to also, as I was saying for later, that I've experienced, I've described to you as a good death, but I can, I'm also aware of very bad deaths that would have not have been bad had end of life been available. Well, for you, Clive, you know, well, what, what, what implications do you see? Well, what, what, you know, when you think about this in terms of research on this, what are the things that you think about when you grapple with or you think about as being possible implications, whether good or bad, um, because of this act? See, I really haven't gone down there because I've been so preoccupied with the fact that, that I want that to be available to me. And I just assume that if the law passes and if it is available, then we'll all be happy. Um, but, but your point, Paula, that we all have to understand the act, I think that's probably a little bit unrealistic until such time as, unless we are well informed, and, and I don't really see that happening. There's no forum such as this where information is being passed on to communities. And if we think about the level of health literacy in our community, for many people it's very low. 
And that's partly because of the fact that we divest so much responsibility to health professionals. And so much is placed in their hand, and we allow them to make decisions on our behalf when really it's not good for us. And I suspect the same might happen unless we've got really good decisions in place and we've got life on it. It might happen in the future. So, can I talk a little bit about some of the implications that you've seen? Um, that you think about is the need for implications, the practical implications. I think you would have had to dissect those in quite a heavy way. Sure, I think, I think for everyone, this is an incredibly personal decision. And some people um, just don't believe that anyone should interfere in the end of life with anyone else, that it's up to nature and God to determine. And I respect you beyond that, I don't agree with but I respect they've got the right to think for it. But I don't believe they've got the right to think it for me or for anyone else. They just have to think it for themselves. So the law should apply regardless of those personal, mostly faith-based beliefs. But understanding that those people's right to have those views should be respected. They wouldn't access end of life tools for the patient because they don't agree with it. Some of the most powerful bits of information that I've read about this type of regime um, came from Oregon, where they've had this regime for a long time. And what they discovered was that an overwhelming majority of people who access end of life tools for the patient never used it. So I got further into that. And, and you know, most of you will have had some experience, little bit, of knowing or being with someone who died. Actually, not all of them. Um, typically as much as older people are in there. But it is part of our life, we know that, that we all want the best possible death for people who die. But you know, actually. The way they're going to die, we just want them to die well. What they found in Oregon was that people got the medication and stopped being scared of the way they were going to they knew they were going to die and you know, be, be angry about it and upset about it and sad. But in the end, we accept it with whatever other feelings might be attached to it. But people were then able to get on with their life and not live the end of their life scared of dying. All the other things that are really important for people to do were able to happen, happen because they had the confidence of control about the way they were going to die and they knew they needed to use it. And for me, that was one of the most powerful things. And I've seen people fight against it. I don't need to tell the horrible stories. I just need to say that I want everyone to live their life the best they possibly can, but also to die the best they possibly can. And for me, this would be a small number of people who have met the criteria, and I believe there are um, much more rigorous safeguards than I would have had in. I think there will be people excluded from this who I personally would have liked to have included, and who would have liked to have been included as well. People who came to the select committee, and in a few words they were able to say, said, let me die. And I think this law will exclude those people. So the safeguards from my point are rigorous, but the biggest thing for me is giving people the ability to be confident about the way they're going to die and live and die much more peacefully as a result, perhaps without ever using the medication. Paul, right, you talked a bit before about some of the issues that you have with this act. If this act wasn't to pass, what do you see as current alternatives that are plausible that would still, I don't know, be an issue the same sort of circumstance? Do you see another way? Um, I guess if, if this particular law was not passed, but New Zealanders wanted some type of end of life regime, then doing something like that in Victoria where they spent four years, um, they involved community, involved disabled people, ethicists, um, people for and against as a, a 
and sexual level um, medical professionals um, and others. And they developed a very lengthy piece of legislation, much more lengthy than our piece of legislation. And, and I think length is partly important because it shows the complexity um, and, and rigor in that particular piece of legislation. So I guess that that would be an alternative where um, that publicly earlier when uh, I saw all the supplementary order papers going into Parliament, there were over a hundred of them, which again shows the complexity and the, the, the changes that members of Parliament wish to debate. And so I guess that if this were not to pass, then um, my recommendation would be if New Zealand has really wanted that choice available, that it be developed uh, the legislation would develop in a very different way than this one, which is for a private members bill uh, introduced into the House. I think, look, okay, I just want to pick up on something um, that you said quite, which, which I agree and disagree with, um, and, and a bit similar with you, Lou. You talk about um, inequities in the health system, and absolutely agree. And so I spend, you know, half my job on is, is inequities in the system in relation to disabled people. And I guess, you know, I've said from the very beginning that, that this debate has taken place in the absence of that discussion about um, equal access to palliative care and um, access to better supports for disabled people in order to live good lives. And I, I really think that's where the focus could have been. Uh, as I said all along, and, and, and should have been. And I think, you know what, I really do want to pick up on the point about choice because I said before, you know, I think I say my choice not being <coughs> made from a, a level playing field. But I also think when we exercise choice as individuals, we do have an impact on other people. We just do have an impact on the rest of society, particularly something of this magnitude. And one of the things that disabled people talk to me about uh, very early stages of this legislation and then throughout was, in the Oregon example that you used, I found really powerful too, this for a slightly different reason. I found it powerful because they did these surveys in Oregon to find out why people wanted to access the regime. And what they found is, and it wasn't actually about pain, it was actually about loss of dignity. And when you unpack those issues around loss of dignity, that just is the way that many disabled people live our lives, being reliant on other people for care supports. And so what disabled people were concerned about, and that's why I guess I voiced my concern about the, the legislation that you drafted and, and the, the context in which it was being debated, is that disabled people were concerned, some many disabled people were concerned about the message that society would take from living one's life like that. So I think you know, individual choice is, is that, it is about individual choice. But I guess individual choice has to be balanced with a set of responsibilities to the potential messages that it can send. And so look, I don't actually have a personal view on, on this. My view is really shaped by what I've heard, what I've read in the mandate around protecting uh, many who are marginalised. Clive, you know, jumping on what Paul was saying, <coughs> it's more about you know, that we do have a health system that does not treat everybody equally. When you think about that and you think about the bill, do you think that the bill affords enough protection to those who get treated the worst in our health system? No, the short answer is no. And just pick up on your point, Paula, about, about health professionals being responsible and, and needing to be part of the change. I'm not confident that, that that's going to happen in the short term. Some of you would have heard of the expression uh, in which doctors are described as the high priests of modernity. Well, you're aware of that expression. And I've witnessed it firsthand where a, a gaggle of specialists stood 
around my mother as she was dying, giving the appearance or giving leading others to believe that they were going to bring her back to life because that's what they were charged to do. They could not entertain the thought that she might have been suffering significant pain, that she needed pain release, that her life was coming to an end. And they only gave her pain relief when I insisted that they put her out of the pain, that they, that they ease her pain and that they end her suffering. And they said, no, we can't do that because we might want to do an operation. And I won't describe the detail of what was happening at the time, but it was, to my naive eye, there was no way that they were going to be able to resuscitate her, but they insisted that they could. And I heard them standing around her speaking in a very strange language I've never heard of. I'm a public health specialist, I'm a public health professional, but I didn't understand what they were saying. But it was, for me, it was evidence that they were testing the situation to try and understand more that would enhance their knowledge about the dying process <coughs> without giving any consideration to the pain of the person before them. And for me, that was a really blatant example of how medical professionals, professionals have this innate belief that they can preserve life for her more and more and more and more and longer and longer and longer. And so it's no, no surprise that we get a lot of attention being paid to the, the, the advances in science that will make, that will extend our lives and help us <coughs> longer and longer and longer and eventually in hundreds of years time the life expectancy will be up beyond 100. So I'm not confident that, that we can rely on medical people to solve this conundrum for us. And it hasn't surprised me to see their virulent opposition to this bill and proposing that we improve the situation by providing better palliative care. If we cannot provide equitable health care in other parts of the health system, I don't have any degree of confidence that we're going to see equitable access of Can I just make a couple of quick comments on this before we get on to the next topic? Um, I, I agree that we have significant pain in the I think the recent um, review of the health system in my head since then makes that blindingly obvious that our West failure in New Zealand is people who live, particularly in isolated rural communities, who just they can't get to the doctor. You know, for most of us in the city, we just think that it's quite strange, but it's like a fundamental need that we're not meeting in New Zealand. Passing this legislation, or, or well, sorry, the legislation's been passed. Supporting this legislation, pressing it, we, we have all opposed to it, will not fix health outcomes. This is just an <coughs> excuse me. This is just an added responsibility in the health system. But it won't fix the health inequities. We need to do that. It's, it's not, not a debate, but it's not relevant actually to this other than the poor health inequities, which is about equal voices, at least to this service, or let's say we keep all services that should be our aims. In the same way as palliative care, we're focusing on the good life that Paul mentioned. And this is not an hard war. We don't, we don't say let's forget about palliative care because we've got end of life choice. End of life choice is really narrow, really limited, and not for a lot of people. Palliative care should be better funded and better supported. But it doesn't work for everyone in the way they want. So it's not right at all. You know, don't, don't, don't come to me and say you should put more money into hospice instead of end of life choice. You should say put more money into hospice because they deserve it and need it. I'll, I'll go for that today. I think that's fair. Um, but it's not my law. Just a quick, quick last word. Um, Paul said there are hundreds of supplementary law papers on the end of life choice law, and that shows the complexity of the issue. What it shows is a filibuster. It's a very old fashioned technique which we use disgracefully in New Zealand to delay the progress of the bill because every supplementary law paper is entitled to have a debate. And that was the anti campaign throughout the whole of this debate. It's a legitimate tactic. I, I just found this too important an issue to do that with, to be honest. But, you know, it's a legitimate political tool. But it was not a, an indication of the complexity of the situation. 
it was an indication of the people who opposed this legislation and their determination to have it delayed as much as possible. So that's what those supplementary papers were about. Let's have a chat about safeguards because I've got some questions here that you guys have written in and, and also some pre written ones that I, I have and they kind of mix them together. So I think safeguards is a nice place to kind of start because there were a few questions about that. And I think, Ruth, maybe, you know, since you've been such a big part of this, can you lay out what you think um, is in this bill that provides? Those safeguards, um, particularly about some of those issues that people are most worried about. Well, I don't know what everyone in the room is most worried about, but I think it's telling what I've heard and you know, 15, 20 years of conversation about this. Um, the most important safeguard is that um, any um, doctor or nurse who suspects that the person is under any pressure at all, like not beyond their own free will, a suspicion, not confirmation, must end the process. And I think most medical professionals take this responsibility really seriously. So someone, that, that's the first thing. There, there cannot be any pressure on a person. So if a person is elderly, you know, they just say, I've done my time. And, and some elderly people feel like that. They won't qualify. They just don't qualify. The criteria is so narrow that a lot, a lot of people who might want to end your life this way, won't meet the criteria. If you're um, disabled, you're going to have a really high bar, actually. And that, that's one of the frustrations for me. I, and I'm really pleased we didn't go along with the career model for, because too many all disabled people are almost entirely excluded from the Victoria end of life medication. And I find that more discriminatory than what we ended up here. It's, it's a, it's a difficult argument. Um, if you're despondent, if you're depressed, uh, you, don't, you don't meet the criteria. You, can't, you have to be mentally competent to make the decision, and if you're despondent or depressed, you're not. So you wouldn't meet the criteria, and if you're lonely or feel unwanted, you wouldn't meet the criteria. Criteria for this is really, really narrow. You have to have a terminal illness that physicians think means your life will end in about six, in six months, and, and I agree with you. They can't make that determination to the day. But that's what the rule reflects their, their best thinking on it, and you have to have unbearable suffering that can't be alleviated. It's really, really narrow criteria. I want it for it. This is what Parliament has decided, and that's what the referendum decides, not whether the law should pass. The law's been passed, but whether the law is enacted or not, as it is. Well, can I just pick up on one thing that you said there, actually, it was one of the questions that someone gave, which is, you talk about um, physical pain and mental trauma. So it says, given this legislation does not allow the choice to end your life if you do have a mental illness, what is the moral distinction between physical pain and trauma that is result of a mental illness? Um, I'm not sure that I've completely got the gist of the question, please um, write it again if, if I haven't got it. But um, if, if you're mentally unwell uh, and deemed incompetent to make a decision, regardless of how else you might feel about your life, you don't meet the criteria. You have to be mentally competent to make the decision. So um, people who have periods of mental unwellness, I'm not likely to be deemed competent to make this, in my view, because I think physicians will be very risk of this. So they'll probably revert to the, you know, you have to have a terminal illness as well. And then that, you know, it's quite hard because they still need to be mentally competent as well. And you said that, because we do know that sometimes laws are passed and it's not until they're enacted that we see that there are some issues. Someone's asked if there is a possibility to add safeguards uh, after the person uses this referendum if it is proven that gaps are in fact exposed. Well, well it's always, everyone really probably knows it's always possible to change the law. Um, we just get a member of parliament to, 
get lucky and get a really still drawn from the ballot, or get a minister to introduce it as part of the ministerial program of work that would be a minister of justice in this case. Um, but this isn't an area that members of parliament are likely to look into too enthusiastically in the future. It's a really hard debate. Um, it's, it's pretty awful seeing um, people traumatised and divided um, by the nature of this debate. I don't think any member of parliament wants that. People generally like to progress legislation where there's a groundswell of support rather than a division. Um, so I don't think it'll be easy to get it changed, but um, and some people will want it repealed completely. Uh, I think that this is only a perspective that's not based obviously on any experience of it, but I would imagine that some of the concerns might come about in the way it is implemented rather than the detail of the law. And that's something that I think is well worth monitoring. You know, that, you know I'd be supportive of having a formal regime to, to monitor that the implementation of the law is as it was intended. Paula, uh, someone's asked if you could outline exactly what additional safeguards you would put into this law that would make you more comfortable about it. Sure. So I'll, I'll sort of respond in a couple of ways. Um, just because I've uh, been anticipating what we've talked about um, some of the safeguards that are, that are there and also the gaps. So I'm addressing the question specifically. So, I want to talk about what the Act says around what steps has to be taken um, by a medical professional. So the first doctor makes an initial assessment about eligibility. There's no requirement that they know the applicant or be trained in assessing eligibility for this regime. They are required to encourage the person to talk with others, but they're also required to tell them they don't have to. In terms of assessing whether the person is free from coercion, the doctor is required to do his or her best. That is, a, as I said previously, a subjective test. And they do their best to ensure that the person expresses their wish free from pressure from any other person by talking with medical practitioners and family. One of the issues we have in New Zealand around um, older abuse, abuse of older people, um, is that it's often the case that that actually happens within families, that that, that subtle coercion, sometimes not so subtle, can come from families. On the point of coercion, though, while health professionals are banned from initiating discussing the option, there's nothing to stop family members from raising it. And even if coercion is detected, it's not an offence. The assessment of competency in the act is also worth understanding. So of course, absolutely, I'm um, the first person to say we have to respect people's rights to make decisions and to exercise their free will. According to the act, the person is considered competent if they have the ability to understand the nature of assisted dying and its consequences. That is a, a very simplistic definition and falls well short of other definitions um, of that word. At no point does the person assess for their mental health condition or physical health condition that may affect their judgment, behaviour or decision making. An individual could be experiencing depression, affected by other transient factors, and yet still pass that competence test. The Act also, and this is the last of the questions specifically made, a number of important safeguards that are present in other jurisdictions. For example, there's you know, judicial oversight. There's no disabled person, um, from that, in relation to that audience, no disabled person included in the um, SEMS group support and consultation, which is what New Zealand is what that stands for, which is a public body uh, created to oversee assisted dying. The review mechanisms are weak, with no requirement to monitor for reasons for choosing the option or inconsistencies across the country in its application. There's no cooling off period for those applying for assisted dying, which is especially important in the context of disability, where you can have an injury and uh, go through enormous periods of, of ups and downs. 
civil laws internationally require at least 10 days to prevent this. Uh, it was a what might be emotional decision making. In other jurisdictions, independent witnesses are required when the person expresses their wish, when they sign the form, and when they receive the medication. But that's not required in the New Zealand context. I guess those are what I see some of the gaps and some of the issues of the existing safeguards. And I know that you know, this may sound a bit technical, and, but actually this, this fundamentally is about this very specific piece of legislation. It is not about a debate on whether or not to have a regime. One of the things that, and, and, and it, it's a safeguard, it's difficult to build into this legislation, but a concept that we, that some of us in the room will, will, will know about is called supportive decision making. It's not a, a kind of phrase we tend to use in today language, but it's really important because what supportive decision making is it's about being able to support a person who may um, have some challenges in bringing their own voice to that decision. It's supporting that person to be able to make a decision. And rather than substitute your decision for them. Our laws in New Zealand are far short of um, uh, having proper supportive decision making in place. So in the absence of some of those other wider protections and other contextual pieces, it remains my view as always has been, uh, as this law has been developed, that the safeguards are not sufficient. And it comes down to really balancing a couple of things. It's balancing the choice that Ruth talks about, and Clive talks about, it's balancing choice and that important uh, right with the safeguards, and you ultimately have to come from view your own minds about whether you think that balance is appropriate or whether it's tipped one way. It remains my view that the safeguards fall short. I just want to finish that piece by touching on, um, I'm trying not to use too much international comparisons because actually I think we, we parliamentarians often commented on you can almost find what you want to find if you start looking internationally in this. But there's one piece of uh, information that I do think is important. In April last year, the Special Rapporteur on the Rights of People, Persons with Disabilities. Uh, so this is a special UN role, an independent role, and um, the person in this role goes around different countries and examines a whole lot of things to do with disability and reports to that country about how they're going. She did a report about the impact of Canada's euthanasia laws on persons with disabilities. And she said, among other things, I have further received worrisome claims about persons with disabilities and in institutions being pressured to seek medical assistance in dying and practitioners not formally reporting those cases where they involve persons with disabilities. Now, again, I would be dramatic and say, well, that's just going to happen overnight here. However, this is a report issued by Special Rapporteur on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities who has had a look at that nation a year ago. It's only been in place for a few years. It's similar, not identical to the regime that will be in place here, but I guess what it does confirm is that actually coercion is not easy to detect, and coercion happens. And I would encourage you to read her report for that more subtle understanding about um, disability. And you know, I would encourage you to access a wide variety of information if you're making your choices, uh, or making choice, sorry, on this important piece of legislation. Uh, have a look at what I've written, have a look at what other people, what the forum against have written, and can really make your decision. But I really encourage you, I just do not buy that we don't have the responsibility to really look at the detail and the Hi, I know that you mentioned so just to jump into the safeguards into something else. And I know you said at the beginning that you didn't want to speak on behalf of Māori or um, Indigenous people, but you do have an important, I guess, viewpoint. I mean, do you see 
any culturally specific questions or concerns with the bill. I don't see any because I am of the, uh, I understand that uh, as I said before, there are some people in favour and some people against the in my community. And I've even read uh, accounts of euthanasia being available in pre European days. And if we look at other indigenous cultures, in particular, uh, indigenous cultures in North America and the Arctic region, uh, it was not uncommon for people who became infirm and were unable to contribute to the, the, the community that they were allowed to go to a place where they could pass away, where they could die. So I think we're going to get a lot of different views about whether this is or is not part of the Ghana and with it part of Māori culture, uh, but I come back, in terms of outcomes, I come back to what I was uh, been talking about, in planning, about inequity and inequitable services and inequitable outcomes, uh, and that that probably is more of a concern. But I just want to add another point that is quite personal to me. Um, two and a half years ago, my partner and I made the decision to come back and live in New Zealand. And that was premised on the fact that we had a government that I was confident in who would bring about more of the significant, important social change that I am very proud of as a New Zealander. And we can go back to the 19, early 1900s and we can identify some really progressive social change that has happened in this country and for which we can be extremely proud. And I think most all of us in this room would be extremely proud of the leadership that we're experiencing at the moment through this pandemic. And I, I see the equivalent happening in terms of this legislation. I, and I, maybe I'm naive, and maybe many of us are naive, but I'm happy to put my confidence in the processes, in the democratic process that has contributed to where we are today. And. <clears throat> I'm just confident that we have initiated a really robust process that will provide protection and provide availability of life and the life force for people like me. Someone asked by that there is criticism around how euthanasia may be disproportionately used for those who with lower relative care, particularly Māori and Pacifica. Do you think that the law deals with this? See, I'm, I'm, I'm a bit naive. <laughs> it looks really bad to ask this one. Uh, but if we <coughs> if we consider that there are lower numbers of Māori who access palliative care, and there's evidence to, that shows that is the case, that non-Māori are more likely to access palliative care at the end of their life than non-Māori, other than Māori, so there's an inequity happening at the end stages of one's life. I think it's a fallacy to think that all Māori have this wonderful support of Zana that will help them in their end days because we know that many older Māori do not live with their Māori, that there are older Māori living by themselves that are in uh, difficult circumstances. So the, the effects of ageing have a similar impact on older Māori as for non-Māori. Uh, and that raises a whole lot of questions about access to end-of-life services, especially about palliative care. Uh, so we have those inequities down for Māori as much as anybody else. Probably more so. Um, Ruth, here's that clarification question that we were looking for in terms of mental and uh, physical. Um, and actually, I think you might want to ask this, but would you support a bill that allowed those suffering from mental trauma to be euthanized? And if not, why is there a moral distinction between the two? Um, no, no, I don't, because this is about the way you end your life and mental trauma is not something you die from directly. I hope that's not too harsh a response. But it's, it, it, it's the same as the, um, the, the issue that um, Paula referred to in her lack of safeguards, where she talked about <clears throat> someone who um, has a significant injury and might go through ups and downs as a result of that. 
She was out caring for a cool dog for three ages and so on. Significant injury isn't a terminal illness. In the same way as significant mental injury isn't a terminal illness. People might want to die because of what's happened to them. What we should do in response to that, in my view as a society, is better support them. This is not something they're going to die from. And they do it at their own hands, in which case we haven't done enough to help them. And I think we should. So I think it's a, it's a relevant, but not um, a, a question that's not directly relevant to this legislation. But I, I get the question. Well, is there anything you want to say on that? Um, yeah, I understand the question. I'll, I'll, I'll refer um, on that. I think Lucas has, has answered that in a similar way that I would answer it. I just want to clarify that the point about the ups and downs of being, being disabled because there are ups and downs is in those, um, what disabled people have talked about is because of that lack of bright light test between disability and terminal illness, when you go through those moments where it is incredibly tough, that at that moment, if you qualify, that um, that's where the cooling off period could be could be useful. But I, I certainly agree with um, Ruth on what our obligations are as a society around helping those in mental distress. And um, I, I can't intuitively on the face of it see a reason to support that. So I agree with Ruth's answer on that. Just on that sort of thing, um, how do you separate mental disability from terminal illness, um, particularly as some um, terminal illnesses can cause depression, for example, and bouts of Parkinson's, which we know uh, depression is part of. I mean, how, how do you separate those things? No, I can't uh, Prior to taking this position, I'd be agreeing that I was an advisor to the Suicide Mortality Review Committee. And some of you may know that we have horrendous rates of suicide in New Zealand, especially among young people. Young people in New Zealand have the highest rate of suicide in the world. And there is a link for some people, for some people who die by choose, choose to die by suicide, there is a link between suicide and mental health. But not all people who die by suicide have mental health issues. The solution to that problem, and the, and the solution that's going to bring down our rates of suicide, is investment, is greater investment in mental health services and greater investment in suicide prevention programs. And it's like many illnesses that we confront. The more we invest in prevention, the better off we're all going to be, and the better the health, the health outcomes will be in the long term. So that's a sort of an obscure response to your answer, but I think it's investment in the services that we all need at some time in our lives is going to be the solution to the problem. Yeah. 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 I think for me on that question, May, as often in this debate, it comes down to safeguards. Will the safeguards Are the safeguards sufficient to ensure a person um, who qualifies, who is eligible, uh, and has mental distress, um, that those issues are dealt with at the time? And I guess one of the things I've talked about before is that there is no requirement to look into whether a person is experiencing mental distress at the time that they're having these conversations. So again, it's about safeguards. In my view, if that safeguard was there, then I think it, it becomes a bit easier to, to address that. But you know, they, these are really good questions, and, and they're actually they're really tough. They're really tough. So I don't, I don't get an automatic great um, level of confidence in any profession, um, but I do think that our doctors are confident to determine whether someone is competent to make a decision. It's a basic part of their training, in the same way as lawyers have as part of their training competency to determine if somebody is competent to make a will. They don't need special training for it, it's part of their training. Doctors recommend people go for surgery. They have to be competent to understand what the surgery is going to involve. 
So it's like part of the 101 of health practitioners training. There's somebody competent to undergo the treatment that we're proposing. Do they understand the implications? Are they making an informed decision? This, this is not a new concept. This is a fundamental part of our health system. And I think it is absolutely a solid safeguard in the end of life choice uh, legislation. So I don't, I don't get any difficulty in the assessment procedure, in the competency. If, if you have depression as a result of a terminal illness, in my view, you would be unlikely to meet the criteria because the depression might make you incompetent to make an informed decision. So, you know, I find some of that stuff really frustrating, but it's a higher level of safeguard than just about any other country in the world. Paul talked about, sorry, I think I've got a lot of points because I, I found it quite odd that the doctor says to the person, you, can, you, you know, you might want to talk to other people about this. It's usually a good thing, but you don't have to. That's actually quite a fundamental right that they should be recommended to talk to some you know, other people. But I haven't explained to them they're not required to under the act. This is a big call. Some people would feel better talking to their family if the doctor said, you know, I know, you talk it over with them. And for some people, that would be the last thing they'd want. We all have different family relationships. It's not up to the doctor to tell you who to talk to but they can help you go through the best possible decision. But they should be required to tell you, you don't have to, it's not part of the law. It's the responsibility of many people are aware of what might help them as a person, but they don't have to under the law. So I don't, I don't see why that's a problem. I think it's, it's actually really helpful for the best possible outcome for people. Yeah. Anyone from the <laughs> Because <laughs> I guess if you speak with the words you use around competency and not those words that are in the legislation, but this is about this piece of legislation, which the words are whether or not the person has the ability to understand the nature of the system dying and its consequences. That's what competency and, is. And that falls short of um, common interpretations of both the legal and the clinical sense. So to inquire into, and you only have to do your best, so his or her best. And what I would say is, yep, people make assessments about competence all the time, but this is not about going to surgery. It's not about have an operation. It, it is the consequences, as we all know, are very different. And I think the test for competence, therefore, coupled with the rest of the safeguards, because the thing about this legislation is you can't put one safeguard and go, that's good, that's good, um, or oh, there's a couple of other ones here that are not so good. But in its totality, are you satisfied? That's the question you have to answer by read as much as you can about it. Clive, what are your thoughts on the whole slip and slope argument? You know, the Accept this, we might accept something later on in our lives, along with the terminal illness, with one year to live, Kayla. What, what are your thoughts on that? On that well, in, in my lifetime, I've been seeing some fairly significant social changes, and I guess I'm old enough to look around here and think we've made some really important gains. I grew up in a time when two people of the same sex couldn't get married. In fact, they were sent off to prison if they were known to be doing things that they shouldn't be doing from a sexual perspective. And I never imagined that one day two men or two women could actually marry each other. So in that short space of time, we've seen significant change. And it contributes to a much more healthy, healthy society where we all feel that we can be part of the social movement. And I don't believe that we're stupid enough 
to support legislation that's going to make life difficult for some and not for others. We're living in a society where there's much greater recognition of the fact that there's a place for all of us. I grew up when some people were rejected from society and there was no, and were marginalised and what are those they were put in the, well they were, and in fact I think in past legislations have recognised the harm that have done to people based on sexual orientation. So no, I don't think we're going to get an answer like this, that's a short answer, I think, I think we're on the way to a much more enlightened, supportive society and it's only going to get better living in this country. I'm just um, looking at the time, I just thought what we might do is this a, a last couple of questions I do recognise, I haven't been able to get to all of them, so I'm sorry, but panelists can be trying to keep everything to answer short. And then what I thought is there's some quick fire and yes or no answers that we could kind of pull it through. And then the last thing is is just maybe one last comment from each of you. Um, maybe either either you choose to summarise the act in a sentence or two, which feels like a very hard thing, or maybe one or two last thoughts that you just want to impart with everyone here. So I just, just firstly for you, Paula, um, someone asked you what your definition of a wrongful death was. Wrongful, wrongful death, yeah. Um, my definition of a wrongful death um, in this situation would be a person who um, who the safeguards um, were not sufficient to protect and we discovered that uh, or it was discovered later after the fact that actually the right process hadn't been followed the process of legislation hadn't been followed um, I think that would be you know, an underway legislation is at the moment it would be has a person died um, that ought not to have um, because the legislation wasn't working um, Ruth, the question here for you, and it might be a quick answer, but in your opinion, what argument against the Act have you heard in the time of all submissions is the best? Is there a good point? Well, I wouldn't have, um, because of this, at the beginning, I would never support legislation if I thought that you could sort of do away with your mother because she wanted access to her money. And people raise those concerns. I mean, that would be horrific to me. Um, or or if, um, disabled people were made to feel unwanted and pushed into a new life choice. That would be unacceptable to me. So. The concerns that many of you will have heard that were raised during the bill. Um, so the bill was either heightened as a result before it was passed as an act, um, or, or it wasn't true in the first place. People have, you know, people did say some things to the select committee which were a little odd and were not possible under the legislation. Um, but they had concerns about it. So if any of those fears were true, and if New Zealand became a less respectful country as a result, I wouldn't agree with it. Um, some quick fire questions here, which I can give either three of you to kind of answer, but then we'll just about the act and how it works. But would someone from overseas be allowed to come into New Zealand and use the end of life? No. Does you mean not all shaking? Well, actually, the borders are closed anyway. So. <laughs> <laughs> Do, uh, does the Act require the patient to instigate the conversation around euthanasia? Yes. Okay. Um, what kind of medical professional can decide how you are able to meet the criteria? Any. Not any. No. Any medical professional who's registered? A nurse. A nurse practitioner, but not. Not, not a chemist, a medical professional. Medical professional. Not a physio. Not a physio. Um, Ruth, you're, you're, if this act does not pass, do you think it is 
is an issue that is likely to return to government soon. The Act has been passed. What's required to implement the Act is an agreement to be passed. Um, if it isn't, I think it will be at least a decade before the bill um, makes an appearance in Parliament. Um, it's about how long it takes to recover from this new debate. It's new because of the Act and how it will be developed as a competition. This is my piece of opinion on how that could be put in the top and how that could be put in the top. A lot of people have been given the headshot, but they don't want this thing to just come to this. I think it's my heart in my heart. I think it's my heart in my heart. Well, I thought it was going to pass this time, and I was just going to put it in the room. There are eight of us here today, and six of us took that here. And I'm just so confident that the youthfulness of this audience and the population of the country is going to really vote to make a change. I find it so stimulating working at the University of Sydney, which is a good part of my students. Uh, a good number of them said they didn't understand the youth orientation, but most of them were supportive of the legislation. And I'm just hopeful that we're going to see the change now and that we're going to need to come back again. Well, maybe this is the time that we just, just do a quick uh, summary. It's not those things 
And so I just really encourage you to, as you are, um, maybe that students of this, so if you listen to three panelists um, tonight, um, you know, read, read, write, and consider the views that the main districts, uh, the human rights analysis on this, is not about the law that should be a regime, and the law that people should have the right to choose how they are to be. It's just it's about this legislation. So I encourage you, as you are, to have seen all of that. And then I know you Thank you.